Thank you, James, for kind introduction uh, and the welcome back from lunch. Uh, how many of you guys know what uh, Zionki has been doing for a living before he decided to dedicate his life to make science more open? So you know that doc uh, Zionki is a doctor, but what kind of doctor is he? Uh, and what he's been doing for a long time. I'll show you a short video, it's two minutes. Hold on. Let's see. Can you put sound on, please? Oh, hold on, it's volume off. should look like and where there should be blood flow. And when there's interruption in that blood flow, it sends off an alert. So the goal now is to get the clot out of the brain as quickly as we can. If we cannot get this clot out of the brain, that this whole area of, of uh, brain that you see here in green, the whole area will be dead most likely. So, you know, what we did in this case is use a smaller bore catheter to, to grab the clot. This is actually the culprit for all his, his symptoms, uh, and now we have it outside the body, and, and we have full restoration of flow. Hello, Dr. Devlin. How are you doing there, sir? Pretty good. How are you? Good to see you. So, Zionki is a radiologist. Uh, 15 years ago, I was uh, brought into the Irish hospital with severe he headache. And the following day, uh, Zionki's colleague, uh, Dr. Brennan, stuck a wire into my leg, brought it up to my brain, and sprayed in each of four arteries contrast, taking pictures of this contrast, filling up blood vessels in my brain. Then. Uh, he called a uh, neurosurgeon named Mr. Ravlock, and uh, they looked at the pictures, and they declared two things. First, they said there is not much brain, the Irish, and second, they said that what there is a mess. A couple of hours later, I had to bring back to the radiology room for another angiogram, and uh, shortly later, I was given two options. I, ha I had to decide the following morning whether they should do, they should perform open brain surgery on me, or they should try to fix, uh, to fill up uh, the space which was created by bursted aneurysm through my leg with a coil. And uh, like uh, in the situation like this, you really want to make the best informed decision as possible. But I was bound to my. Uh, to, to the bed, and the uh, internet was still, the mobile internet was still quite poor then. So I asked three of my friends to do as much research as they can. And all of them, all three of them came back with, uh, with uh, the first thing they said that they hit a paywall. So uh, I, I'm here to, uh, I'm very grateful uh, to, uh, to Zionki's colleague to introduce me to the problem of access to information. And second, I think we should all be very grateful to Zionki for organizing this event. So I think he deserves a another round of applause. Uh, 
I was very lucky uh, to be born uh, in Soviet Union, as I look back, where all school books were free, education was free, and medical care was free. Uh, but what I'm trying to say here is that uh, uh, I do not remember the moment when I consciously decided when, where, and by whom I was going to be conceived. And that's, I think, true to anybody here. We don't choose our gender, our skin color, and uh, we don't choose how prosperous our parents are. Uh, so uh, I think that uh, the kind of, I have Soviet idealistic views that each, each life should be equally valuable. Uh, and uh, I believe that anybody anywhere in the world should have access to the vital information when it's needed, like researchers, patients, doctors. Uh, we live in the world which is, uh, which is uh, driven by algorithms today. So, for example, in China, there is a social scoring system on trial at this particular moment. Uh, and that system allows Chinese government to combine academic records with medical records, with criminal records, with social media records, with financial transaction records, and with shopping habits, and to assign to each and every citizen uh, a score. So if you uh, buy a pack of nappies, you are caring parent, and your uh, mortgage, like uh, the interest you are paying on your mortgage should go lower. If you're buying a pack, if you're buying a pack of beer, you should expect that uh, your uh, health insurance premium could go up. And uh, if you're disagreeing with your government, it's very possible that you won't be able to buy a train ticket. And if you're on the train, you should expect that uh, to hear announcement that if you don't have a valid ticket or if you have uh, if you misbehave yourself, this will be recorded on individual credit information system. This picture was taken a couple of weeks ago by m one of my Twitter buddies uh, on Shanghai Beijing train. So it's all reality today. And. If you uh, think that any kind of legislation or, or your government will protect you from this kind of algorithms, you are dreaming, you are not for real. Because algorithms have no borders. And companies which provide governments with algorithms, they are at that moment refocusing from making money from utilizing consumer data to providing and selling information to your government, to your bank, and to insurance company. Uh, so on one hand, algorithms can be uh, used to help people to make, uh, to help patients and doctors to make life-saving decisions. On the other hand, it's just a tool that can be used uh, against us. And uh, when it comes to uh, Research data, publicly funded, how is it stored? How? Well, it now lives, now lives on over 3,000 institutional repositories around the world. And then it advertised in one out of 30,000 uh, academic journals. And as we've learned from John Tennant uh, early on in the morning, only 25% of them are open access. Uh, like uh, this is a map uh, approximately of, of institutional repositories. Uh, they, all of them have at least three things in common. First, like uh, institutions which build them e uh, invested lots of money resources to, uh, to have them. Secondly, like it takes at least two people to, uh, and, uh, and uh, $300,000 at the very minimum to uh, to run each of them, and uh, uh, each institutional repository has a single point of is a single point of failure. 
and I believe that we should move from uh, infrastructure for preservation of research outcomes uh, with science do not turn off uh, into uh, the system which cannot be turned off. And how the system should look like? Uh, I'd like to compare it with the road network. The first sophisticated road network was built of, by the Romans during the Roman Empire times. And uh, they didn't invent the roads, obviously, but they, they uh, were the first to decide that the roads have to be as straight as possible. And the roads basically helped the empire to, to exist for 500 years, and it became uh, uh, roads became arteries connecting the vast network, of, uh, like uh, uh, the melting pot of cultures, religions, and institutions. Uh, they serve the purpose. They allow to move troops from Portugal to Constantinople as quick as, quick as possible. Goods delivered, people were moving. Um, so many of us here, uh, uh, I believe, want to build applications, some kind which will improve or which will make the science more open. Uh, I see applications as vehicles which go on the road. And if you like, and each, uh, each piece of gravel on each stone which goes onto, on, into the road can be seen as a research object. Uh, but before we are building this vehicle, which will be using the road, I think we should, we should have some kind of idea in what kind of condition this vehicle will be used. Will it be uh, like, uh, well, like, because unless we know for what kind of environment the vehicle is built, we may end up driving tractors, Belarus, on German autobahns and drive Lamborghinis on Russian Siberian roads. Uh, there is nothing wrong with tractors of Belarus, tractors Belarus, I have to say, they are probably the most unhackable tractors which still remain. But let's stick with Lambos. Uh, how many of you want to build killer apps? Yeah. You? Yeah? No, no, no. We don't need killer apps. We need Lambo apps. And by Lambo apps, I mean applications which Lambert Heller, who is on the back, who is Lambert, Lambert Heller? He left? Well, he has just left. Oh, all right. Lambert Heller uh, and his, uh, his uh, colleagues, academic librarians, can advise their researchers to use when they come and ask him what they should do to comply with increasing demands from funders from, from uh, European Union to comply with uh, data preservation policies and uh, to make their research outcome findable, discoverable, and reusable for generations to come. Uh, yes, uh, actually, uh, Ferruccio Lamborghini, like uh, when he, start, he started from building tractors and then he moved to supercars. Uh, but like if, uh, and those lumbers which I build now, they're still, it's like they're still able to pass each other on the roads, because Romans, when they are building their road network, decided that each road needs to be four point, at least 4.2 meters wide. And we're still building around the world roads which are as wide as this. And if you look at the cross, cross section of each road, it, uh, yeah, we create embankment and you uh, fill up with uh, uh, gravel and uh, different sources of material put on top, and, uh, and then it's, uh, it's maintained and lasts for 
uh, for many years. So in the same way, we should see a digital infrastructure for preservation of scientific data. And the vehicles which will be used will go on top of it, and they will be using it. So there is a couple of people here in the audience, James and Carmen was participating in our events and Jönkis. Uh, we've been thinking for uh, what cross-section of infrastructure for preservation of scientific data should look like. And it all starts from, uh, from protocols. We need to decide what works and needs to be preserved. So we need to know what is uh, like, uh, what kind of, what is data object and what kind of uh, metadata we want to be preserved. We want uh, to use peer-to-peer -peer openly licensed protocol, which allow to address each and every research object by its content. Now, there is, uh, there is a number of groups working in this space at this moment. IPFS has been mentioned already, which is interplanetary file sharing system. SafeMate is working on develop something similar or that project, for example. And we know for sure that the system which is worse to be created needs to be decentralized. Because otherwise we come back to the system which has a, sing a single point of failure, which can be switched off intentional or not. Uh, and we need to reuse what's already useful, such as digital object identifier or ORCID ID. Services go on top of it and applications. So yeah, let's reiterate on it. Uh, there is a number of groups now deciding what research object is, is, is uh, like, and uh, we need more academic librarians uh, like Lambert to uh, to be included in the conversations like we uh, like, like we are having here. Uh, distributed uh, like openly licensed hypermedia protocols, uh, which allow to address those digital uh, di digital object by their content. IPFS needs to be uh, like we see it as a solution for creating this distributed system. And uh, it has to be governed. So uh, in the way that uh, we can audit and verify on what kind of system. And surely you need to find stuff so like those objects needs to be made discoverable. So, uh, I'm inviting you here to, uh, to help us to develop and to, uh, to participate in designing the system, which uh, like to design governance is very important because people who are using the system have to have a stake in it and they have to uh, be able to influence decisions which will affect it. So, if we want to use, uh, if we want to use, if we want algorithms to benefit not only governments, corporations, and banks, but them to be uh, employed for, to help researchers, doctors, and patients to make important decisions, we need to create a, a distributed system which allows us to, uh, to make this data findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable. Uh, yeah, so uh, there is a number of groups trying to resolve it, uh, to look at it on different levels. There is, for example, Freya project, which is funded by the European Union, 
it's uh, three years long. Um, there is uh, like a protocol labs working on IPFS, which, which created IPFS, and they're trying to uh, resolve the problem with uh, like those identifiers needs to be persistent and immutable, which is still uh, an unresolved problem. Uh, European Union, yes, it has the European Open Science Cloud, which needs to be included into conversation. Uh, and then it's intercontinental, because in, 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 in Europe, for example, there is Research Data Alliance very, very active in this space. And uh, in the United States, there is data together. And I don't think that both talking to each other. So uh, all of them have to be included in conversation somehow before like, uh, we, uh, in order for us to create this infrastructure where uh, we can drive Lambos. Thank you. Thank you, Dennis. So we're now open for questions. If you put your hand up, a mic will come to you. I'll just maybe ask a quick one. Dennis, you do a weekly uh, discussion forum and we've, you've done events. Is there, where's, where's the best place to find out about uh, where you meet up? Yeah, we have uh, a weekly call every Tuesday at one o'clock. Uh, you can find information on, on Gitter probably about it. Uh, and uh, yeah, uh, Tuesday call, it will be like the best the best way to contact, or you can contact us individually, and we'll put you, we'll let you know what's going on. Okay, thank you very much.